Good afternoon or morning. I'm Liba Wenig Rubenstein, director of the Aspen Business Roundtable on Organized Labor at the Aspen Institute Economic Opportunities Program. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, Workplace Democracy, Sharing Power and Decision-Making at Work. This conversation is part of our Opportunity in America series in which we examine the changing landscape that workers face and how we can create an economy that works for everyone. Before we get started, just a quick review of our technology for those of you who are joining via Zoom. Um, all attendees are muted the whole time. Um, and there's two functions, the Q&A button and the, um, and the chat um, in, your, in Zoom. Please use the Q&A to submit and upvote questions. And then you can use the chat to share perspectives, ideas, examples, resources, or just reactions related to today's topic. Um, please do uh, stay for a moment after the webinar ends to respond to our quick feedback survey, which will open in your web browser as soon as you leave the webinar. We do encourage you to post about this conversation on the social media platform of your choice. The hashtag is hashtag talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues during this webinar, please do message us in the chat, or you can email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. This event is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website and other platforms. Um, closed captions are available. Please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to activate them. So we will get started. Um, you know, democracy is a word that we have all heard so much in recent months, it may feel like it's been sapped of meaning. Um, and depending on your perspective, the result of this month's election either demonstrated that America's system of self-governance is in imminent peril or that it's absolutely as strong as ever. Um, but either way, democracy has never been defined solely by the mobilization of voters to the polls every two or four years. Rather, it is a system of behaviors, norms, and practices that tap the wisdom of people to participate in decision-making that affects them. So what role, if any, should democratic principles play in the workplace? and how do they relate to economic opportunity? Businesses are famously not democracies, but their success does depend on, among other factors, the willing and committed participation of workers and input of workers. And we know from our EOP colleagues' work on job quality, as well as the US Surgeon General's framework for workplace well-being, that for workers, voice, agency, and participation in decision-making are critical elements of a good job that supports worker mental health and well-being. At EOP and at the Roundtable, we believe that to expand economic opportunity in this country and bridge some of our deepest economic and social divides, working people do need more power, power to negotiate the terms of their work and to shape economic life in our democracy. The conventional assumption of American business leaders that sharing any power in decision-making is to be avoided obscures opportunities for progress, leaves many workers stuck in the middle, and overlooks historical and comparative evidence that sustained economic growth happens when both workers and employers have a seat at the table. In fact, there is a long, if inconsistent tradition in American business of valuing employee participation in decision-making. Even John D. Rockefeller Jr. said in a 1919 uh, address to the National Industrial Conference, Surely it is not consistent for us as Americans to demand democracy in government and to practice autocracy in industry. When workers have a say in the conditions of their employment, they are better able to ensure their own safety and well being, negotiate fair wages and benefits, and create a work environment that drives productivity and innovation. Participatory workplaces breed democratic values and combat polarization by bringing together workers across differences to make hard decisions and act together in solidarity. And research shows that organized workforces can support good corporate governance and positively impact productivity while also attracting and retaining talent. That's why we at the Roundtable organize business leaders privately and develop resources to share publicly, like the playbook called The, Share pa the Shared Power Advantage that we published earlier this year that details how leaders can build thriving companies where workers have a seat at the table through a lot of the mechanisms that we'll explore today. According to Gallup, the percentage of employees 
who strongly agree that their organization cares about their overall well being hit a record low since Gallup has been asking this question of 21% this year. And generally, kind of worker uh, self reporting of their well being is at an all time low. Whether you look at the historic levels of union activity or the recent election exit poll, it's clear that American workers today feel that their voices are not being sufficiently heard. None of us on this panel are political scientists or pundits. We are not here to interpret the meaning of the election results or speculate about what exactly the operating environment will be for either workers or employers. We can safely say that workplaces are entering a period of change and uncertainty. But in some ways, that's not very new from the Great Recession and the fissuring of the workplace to Me Too and Black Lives Matter to COVID, the American workplace has experienced a series of disruptions in recent years, and many of these participatory and democratic practices have stood the test of time. If anything, now is a time when the private sector and all employers will be called upon to step up. It will be more important than ever for leaders in the workplace and those advising and coaching them to promote engaging, participatory, and supportive work environments. So today, we've assembled a stellar group of experts to help us understand how democratic mechanisms in the workplace can help address issues facing workers and employers alike, what success looks like, and the barriers and enablers workplaces face. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. We have Julian McKinley, co-executive director of the Democracy at Work Institute, also known as DAWI. Uh, we have Larry Williams, founder and president of Union Base, and Lenora Palladino, an associate professor in the Department of Economics and School of Public Policy at the Uni University of Massachusetts Amherst. So to get started today, I'm gonna to ask each of you to please introduce yourselves um, and if appropriate, your organization, and then please share with us to kick us off what from your perspective it means to have a democratic workplace? Is it about specific values or behaviors or systems or outcomes? And why is it important in the big picture for both workers and employers? And uh, we'll kick it off with you, Larry. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Larry Williams Jr. I'm the founder and president of unionbase.com. And uh, I started my career off working at the Teamsters uh, back in 2007. And my career led me to work at the Sierra Club, the largest environmental organization in the United States, as labor coordinator. Um, and there I founded a union, uh, co-founded a union called Progressive Workers Union, or PWU, that represents workers across the nonprofit landscape. Um, later, I served on several executive positions at nonprofit organizations, and one of which I had unionized staff. So I sort of see it uh, on both sides of the coin in a deep way. Um, now running union base, I work to educate union leaders and employers about the labor movement and try to sort of uh, fill in the gap there because I think it's a movement that is not very well known in terms of how it works and functions. Um, our latest initiative, Union Employer, is about working with employers and unions to help workers find union positions and spread awareness about available union jobs. Um, so to answer your question, I believe that democracy in the workplace is all about uh, is about all of the above those specific values, behaviors, systems, and outcomes. But I do think in practice in the workplace, it means including workers in areas of decision-making that impact employment. Of course, that includes the permissible subjects of bargaining like wages, hours, and working conditions, but also things that employers don't necessarily have to bargain about, such as layoffs and internal policy, um, as we've seen in news recently. Thanks so much, Larry. Um, Julian. Thanks so much, Leva. Um, just first, let me say, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about workplace democracy. Um, my name is Julian McKinley. As you said, I'm the co-executive director at Democracy at Work Institute, also known as DAWI. And as an organization, we work to expand access to worker ownership nationally for workers who we describe as being locked out of good jobs and opportunities to own businesses. Um, specifically, we work to benefit recent immigrants, uh, workers of color, and low-wage workers. And notably, we were started by the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, which is the national grassroots membership organization for worker co-ops. Um, and we were started to support growth of the field as a whole. 
Uh, so the, the way that we we go about our work is through research, business innovation, education, policy support, and partnership development. And um, like regarding you know what does what what does uh, workplace democracy mean for us? You know, worker co-ops are they're guided by a set of seven principles of cooperation. Um, but to avoid sort of reading down a list and sort of getting to the heart of what we do, uh, democracy for us is about shifting power and opportunity to workers who really help create a company's value. Um, it's about creating the terms for workers to make a family sustaining wages, to work in safe environments, and for them to determine the future of their work experience. Thanks, Julian. Um, and Lenore, um, before I uh, let you introduce yourself, I, I, I also want to ask, I know that you're not an historian by trade, but as our resident academic, um, I'd love it if in your introduction, you could also take us through some of the history of thinking and practice of workplace democracy in this country. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone who's um, watching right now. It's a, it's a tough time for many of us in the United States. And so it's so important, I think, that we um, think about both political democracy and economic democracy. Um, I'm an associate professor of economics and public policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Like, you know, uh, like my colleagues on the panel, I come out of both the labor movement and um, spent some time working as an attorney with worker cooperatives. But the way I'll just briefly answer your first question, the way I think about democracy, when I was a union organizer, of course, we were organizing around the terms and conditions of employment. But what people who were leaders in the union and leaders in workplaces where they were organizing their coworkers to form new unions, what they mostly, their most uh, important focus was on dignity and respect at work. And I think shifting power in workplaces and shifting power in society are all about dignity and respect for all of us, not just for uh, a few at the top, right? So um, just a couple anecdotes in terms of our history. You know, I'm, I'm not a historian, as you said, but I love talking about the history of workplace democracy and economic democracy more broadly, because there is actually a really rich history in the United States that even many of us who work on progressive economic policy issues aren't aware of, right? And we should know this history to help us, you know, feel more empowered to take action today. So um, as large corporations became dominant for the first time in the, 18, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was actually a tremendous movement for industrial democracy. And the, what we remember about this is that we got labor law and we got um, you know, the focus on unions in the United States. But that movement at the time was actually calling for broader participation in the businesses that they were helping uh, strengthen directly. Adolf Burley, for example, who is a, um, a leading uh, lawyer and author who many people mistakenly think of as one of the founders of uh, intellectual thought that supports shareholder primacy, actually wrote an article called How Labor Could Control over 100 years ago in 1922. And in his book that's most famous, The Modern Corporation, he called for the social control of business, supporting uh, workers' participation as well as um, business participation. The militancy of labor at the time led to works councils in different businesses like Filene's and General Electric here in Massachusetts. Fast forward to the 1970s and we've seen union leadership participating on boards of major auto companies, of pension funds. And you know, today we see what we're gonna, I think, talk about uh, for the most part today, we've seen the continued growth of worker cooperatives, employee owned organizations, and companies and profit sharing alongside a growing and renewed labor movement. And I think that there's a really important um, moment that we have here to bring together all of these different ways that we can strengthen workplace democracy. Thank you so much for that history. And it is, I think it's it's very empowering to be reminded um, that, uh, you know, the kind of conventional wisdom that, that um, governs employment right now is just not, uh, definitive in any way. Um, uh, so let's turn to exploring kind of why and how companies can effectively implement mechanisms for these sort of participatory um, practices in governance and decision making. Julian um, Dawi, as you said, comes out of the co-op movement, but you do work with firms that follow other models of worker ownership, like employee stock ownership plans. So for those in the audience who are less familiar with employee ownership, 
Can you please share a little bit more about the different forms and in what ways they, they both democratize and strengthen workplaces and kind of who stands to benefit the most from worker ownership in these forms? Yeah, so ownership is a term that's used quite broadly these days, and in part because ownership exists along a spectrum. There, it looks like many different things, and it's something that many Americans are familiar with in some respects. Um, the common denominator, in terms of you know whatever form you're you're talking about, uh, is financial benefit that's provided to a set of employees. Uh, most commonly, a select set of employees are awarded company shares or have an opportunity to, opportunity to purchase those shares at a discount. Our focus at DAWI is on firms that have what we call broad-based ownership. So ownership of businesses that is shared throughout the business, um, and that include elements of workplace participation. The most common form in which this shows up is in employee stock ownership plans, as you mentioned, but also uh, employee-owned trusts and worker cooperatives. And so each of these forms uh, include financial benefit uh, to workers, which is tied directly to business performance. So if a business does well, employees see the value of their shares rise. If a business struggles, the financial benefit that's provided to workers is then negatively impacted. Um, In each of these business types, there are sort of varying degrees of participation that makes sense for them. ESOPs that are participatory, for example, they may provide employees an opportunity to have say in whether or not the business is sold um, and to whom it's sold. They may also have a representative of of their employee base on the board of directors, for example. Um, They may also and and frequently share information about the business, so financial information to help people understand their place within the the business and how they contribute to uh, its overall success. Um, Worker co-ops, which are on the far end of the spectrum, are businesses that are fully owned and controlled by their workers. So they collectively decide what happens to business profits annually. They certainly elect the board of the uh, the board of directors, and those directors are elected from the from the members within the business. Um, They might collectively also determine uh, changes in in company strategy and things like that. Um, So there's certainly a a, a wide range of opportunities and um, ways that it shows up in, in businesses that we would call democratic. Thanks so much, Julian. Um, Larry, uh, I'll turn to you. You've been both a union organizer and a union employer. Um, can you talk about the role of worker participation in different phases of the unionization and labor management partnership process and what case you can make to employers that unions can be valuable partners precisely because of their democratic nature? Sure. Um, you know, funny enough, I've actually served as, you know, a steward in, you know, various positions in a union, um, you know, from the president to the steward. And so you have different levels of engagement that sort of give you the full scope. Um, and the early phases of a unionizing campaign can be very scary for workers who are organizing. They're not sure how the employer, employer is going to react. Are they going to support their efforts? Are they going to get pushback? Uh, and then there's a the legal framework that both the employer and the union operate in that can be conducive to workers feeling a little bit more fearful about what will happen because there's not many protections. And so um, once the declaration of a union actually happens and it's out there, there is a choice by the employer. You know, do they want to step up and show support for the workers or do they want to drag them through the long, often contentious process that could damage the relationship between them and the management? So it's key to remember uh, for management that the uh, unions and employers, uh, I should say, uh, employer staff are made up of humans. And the process, even though it can be a bit inhumane, um, if you choose to be humane in that process, you can allow um, that process to define how democracy will live within the, the organization. Um, if, if you start with humanity, I believe the rest will figure itself out. Having been in very contentious union battles <laughs> that took us to like, you know, three o'clock in the morning, uh, walking away from the table, almost being a strike to having great relationship with human resources leaders now that I'll, I'll DM them on LinkedIn and say, I'm really glad about what we built and how long it's withstood the test of time. And I can see, um, you know, workers' lives benefiting from that. So, I do believe if both sides enter unionization and bargaining process from a place of humility and assuming the best instead of assuming the worst, uh, then progress is possible. And then lastly, I say, having been on both sides, uh, I've seen management groups accept unionization and do a great job of supporting their workers and getting a positive outcome as a result. And I have been on management teams that have been led by bad advice as well, where you you get the anti-union lawyer, 
and you're spending a thousand dollars an hour for them just to tell you to basically stonewall your workers. And, you know, you can kind of expect where that goes. Uh, on the other side, when I've been an executive, um, uh, I basically told a board of mine uh, after uh, the workers declared they wanted a union, I emailed each board member individually and I said, according to my experiences in unions, what you should do is accept this uh, unionization immediately. Um, I got, I believe, 10 out of 10 board members to accept without condition and myself as well and got back to them really quickly. That way there was no no space for there to be limbo where the workers are really scared about what's going to happen. And I you know, let the board members know if there were any questions they had, they could come to me and we could also seek counsel as well. So there's a lot of things that you could do to make your workers uh, excited about the process and happy about the process. Thanks, Larry. Um, Lenore, you have argued in, in a lot of your work that board level co-determination, um, that is worker representation on boards should be adopted more widely in the US. Can you tell us a little bit what this looks like in countries where it's already a well-established practice? And then are there any notable examples in this country and kind of what your work suggests an American version of the model might look like? Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, so, you know, there's many companies that make sense to be employee owned or to be worker cooperatives. Some of our largest companies, though, I think that's, you know, that's a ways down the road, let's say. And I think there's a lot of room to empower worker to, to participate in the actual decision making within companies right now. So when we, you know, we should step back for a minute and think about, you know, what is a corporation? It's an entity that's supposed to be productive and innovative in producing its goods and services to meet the needs and, and wants of, of society, right, of consumers. We have this paradigm in the United States of shareholder primacy, which tells us that the only decision makers within a company, within corporate governance, should be shareholders. When in fact, shareholders in you know, modern day, especially when we hold shares through index funds, through asset managers, shareholders have the least to do in many cases with any given company. And it's the workforce and the management of the company that really are the ones that make decisions uh, that you know, either cause the company to innovate and grow or to fail. And so I think worker participation on corporate boards is one structural way to make sure that, that the people who usually know the most about how companies are producing and how they could innovate are participating in the business process. This is, you know, it's important for me to say this is, you know, a complement to unionization and collective bargaining where workers are organizing around the terms and conditions of employment that should, you know, stay as it is and worker participation on boards is a way to increase uh, worker voice in the overall course of the business. So very briefly, if people are familiar with this at all, they might be familiar with Germany, where there is a strong system of what's called their co-determination, where workers are organized such that they have mechanisms of representation on corporate boards and they have sectoral bargaining in many uh, sectors within the, U within the German economy. Co-determination has worked well in terms of improving productivity, improving uh, many of the conditions in Germany, though certainly not perfect, right? None of the innovations we talk about will, will be magic uh, silver bullets. France also has an interesting model where they have for some large companies requirements, both for employee ownership and worker participation on boards. Uh, there's other models around the world my take, just to stay somewhat brief, is that the U.S. should not import a model from Europe or other countries, right? We have a very different system of labor law and corporate governance law, and so we need to stay grounded in what will actually work in the United States. And I wrote an article called Economic Democracy at Work that looked at, okay, we have U.S. labor law. We need to actually uh, hold on to, I believe, the prohibitions in U.S. labor law on what are called company unions, right? Unions that are dominated by management that don't actually serve worker interests. But some of those prohibitions that developed um, that are important around prohibiting company unions have kept us from actually enabling workers to have a collective uh, voice on corporate boards. So what I was thinking about and many other uh, advocates and organizers and scholars before me have thought about is how can worker representation on boards be authentically representative 
So it has an organizational structure such that you're not just having one person elected to a board and they're there by themselves, right? Not representing anybody. How do we do that within US labor law? Um, I think is one really good question. And I propose some um, different mechanisms in, in the piece. And then I also think that there's other ideas developing that are you know, being talked about in, in forums like this about reforming the compensation committees specifically on boards so that there's consideration of overall workplace issues and participation it, at minimum in an advisory role by workers, even if not in a voting capacity. I also think that the models that have been developed at the uh, at the scale of worker cooperatives and employee-owned businesses can teach us a lot about what might work at the larger scale at some of our largest businesses, and we should continue to learn from those models and and try different innovations at the at the large corporate level. Thanks, Lenore, and, I, and I'll just say, you know, we have a, a member of our roundtable who has, been a, I think the third year of an experiment with um, employee, uh, an employee representative on their board. It's a software company called Honeycomb. They already have profit sharing as is, you know, pretty standard in the tech industry. Um, and to your point, I think that the, the most impactful part of that experiment has been the structures that they build up around the worker representative to help inform their participation and the transparency um, of communication between the board and workers um, and improving those lines of communication and um, and bringing a worker perspective to kind of what's what's relevant um, in both directions. And so- um, Can I add one thing, Leva? So yeah, that, please. That I thought of when you were speaking as well. Um, you know, we lived through uh, the pandemic, we lived through the COVID-19 era, and we saw in that time, I think, a real missed opportunity for workers to participate in the in the discussions that their companies were having, particularly particularly around workplace safety and health. Right. So within um, U.S. labor law, there is room for workers to form committees to discuss with management how to improve safety and health in the workplace. And if we had had those types of standing relationships. We could have seen, especially in a lot of our businesses that had essential uh, workers who were at work every day in the you know very early parts of the pandemic um, before we had the vaccine and everything, those experiences, those workplaces could have been much healthier places and more productive companies ultimately. So I think those types of models, sometimes it gets very abstract, oh, workers on boards, you know, what could it mean? I think the experience of the pandemic helps us concretize what some of the benefits could really be. Absolutely. And I think there are some examples also of unionized firms that 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 were able to weather COVID um, more successfully than some of their non-unionized competitors. I know, um, you know, the kind of UPS FedEx example um, was brought up a lot in, in that period. And, you know, and I, I have to imagine that that's one of the reasons why um, is kind of managing the health and safety and, and worker participation in that conversation. Um, so thank you for that. Um, for for all of you, um, I'm curious, what have you learned about the factors that are most critical to employers implementing these strategies successfully when, when they do have them? And in particular, what kind of training and what kind of feedback mechanisms are necessary? Um, and then perhaps most importantly, like how do workers and employers alike know if this is working? I'll jump in. Um, I think... Right. When it comes to the bargaining process, it is important for uh, employers to have some training and guidance on how to communicate, you know, with the workers through that process. Um, you know, it can be very, I think, tense in the beginning because this is a new sort of process for both sides. And oftentimes, like I mentioned before, if a law firm is leading the engagement with the workers uh, and is done purely through a legal lens, then, you know, it's, the question becomes, you know, what do we have to do? What are we required to do that won't get us in legal trouble, which are, it's a fair question. Um, but the most important thing is that humility I was talking about and listening to the concerns of your employees. I'll just use one example, something I heard the other day on CNBC. Um, there was a, a, a person giving advice on what employers should do during this time with the labor of people. And they kept saying, just listen to your employees, just listen to your employees. But the thing I didn't hear was, 
uh, be prepared to respond to what they say. Because a lot of times employers will put out surveys, they ask these questions, and then they just don't do anything. So then that gives the workers the impression that you're not listening, even if you are. Even if you get stuck in debate, maybe you should share, hey, this is why we're stuck here. All of that type of communication really helps people feel like the management is really engaged and they actually care what the workers think. Um, and then um, I think the training could help with how to communicate and not sound aggressive or insensitive. Um, again, you know, corporate speak can just be something that you've learned in law school or that you learn in business school, but it can come off very cold and, and not very human. Um, and that actually, you know, the, the need to be careful in how you communicate in those times goes for both the employer and the workers. Um, and because I've, I've been on the side of the workers and, you know, we're sounding like we're ready to go to war regardless when that's clearly not the case. Right. Um, I've also been working with managers and executives to talk about how to be more comfortable in your discussions so that your engagements come off the right way. Um, once a union and management have formed a contract, things change a lot and there's a lot more clarity. And then you can create something like a labor management committee. Right. It's like one step before the board where we're talking about day-to-day -day issues, like is the you know time policy actually working? Um, do we have do our credit cards have limits that are too low? You know, I was uh, basically the reason why we started Progressive Workers Union. I, you know, from a personal perspective, I was traveling a lot as an organizer. I would go to two or three cities in a month, and I would check into a hotel, and the hotel would have a limit that you have to put at least I think like six or seven hundred dollars down on the card. But my card's limit was like five or $600. So oftentimes I would arrive and my card would get rejected. So it's not only embarrassing, but, you know, you're stuck and I have to call my manager in the middle of the night. It was, it was a lot of stuff like that. And I had tried to go through my operations manager or operations director, and there was like no response. Found out there was 100 other organizers going through the same situation. So imagine 100 people in 100 cities getting stuck in hotels. And that had been happening for 25 years. So we brought that issue to the labor management committee. And the issue was fixed like overnight. Our limits were increased because we realized when we put our heads together, you're only risking two, one or two thousand uh, dollars that, you know, let's say that the person overspends or something like that. And when that happens, then you can reduce it. But you have to have a way to actually have the communication, regular meetings between union leaders, mid-level managers, and in some cases, senior management allow you to fix problems before they become major problems. Yeah. So just to, to jump in on that, I think that that's such a great example of what's possible when um, employees across a business are really able to contribute to decision making, shed light on kind of like what their work experience is and um, create efficiencies where otherwise, you know, it would go overlooked. I think the way that um, I like to think about it from an employee ownership standpoint is, you know, if I am a, a worker who's making $17 an hour and I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, lots of times my focus um, what's important to me isn't necessarily going to be aligned with the business just inherently. You know, I'm really thinking about how do I clock in and, and clock out and do my work and collect my paycheck and do my work to the extent that my supervisor is not breathing down my neck. Um, and I might, particularly around like the holiday season, um, um, look forward to the potential of overtime pay because that week groceries are going to be less expensive or, or easier to afford, um, might be able to afford some extra gifts during Christmas time. Uh, whereas the for the business efficiency and productivity is really number one, and so I'm you know in the absence of efficiency and productivity, uh, I may think about needing to increase managerial oversight. Um, my costs are going to go up, and I'm thinking workers aren't really doing their job, and that's not the case. But if I I'm, if I'm able to support the worker who's making seventeen dollars an hour to understand from a day to day how their individual tasks contribute to the company's success overall. And just as an added benefit, show how that, um, you know, increased productivity will benefit them financially, that worker really becomes fully invested and begins to, I think, make some of the, um, the observations that, that Larry identified and say, these are some of the critical challenges that, we're, that I'm seeing on the job every single day. My manager probably doesn't see it, but this is something that will really improve our entire performance. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a great example. A bigger picture, when we're thinking about um, employee ownership and what it looks like to, you know, uh, create a democratic workplace. We think about it as building the foundation of a house. And so there are four corner posts that are needed when you, you build a house. You need a strong foundation, right? Um, those corner posts for us are sharing money, sharing information, sharing power, 
and developing people. Um, each of these elements requires a uh, commitment to positioning workers to contribute to decision making, um, but also to think about how do we help them build the skills so that they understand what's going on within the business. So that's where you see that overlap in terms of sharing the information in an effective way, sharing power. That's an opportunity to to give. That's an opportunity to have my voice contribute to um, outcomes, and then developing the skills within people. From a like the business's standpoint. You got to think about, and this goes to, I guess, your question, Liba, about how do you measure it and you know how do you approach it. Um, number one is that it takes time, right? You're not going to, I think, change a culture overnight. Um, lots of workers have no idea how to read a financial statement, so you've got to help them build those skills, understand how to read it, create language where folks really can sort of connect with it. Um, and there are, I think, a couple of examples of how to do this well. I think open book management is a really common practice to begin to share financial information with workers to uh, to train them and, and bring them along the pathway from uh, that helps them connect the dots between their individual tasks and the business outcomes. Um, doing things like creating critical numbers for departments. These are basically, you know, KPIs, but very, very specific within each person's role so that they understand, okay, that's the mark that I've got to hit together. And we're going to be able to see the benchmarks that, that we, uh, that we all want to achieve. I'll just add a couple things. Cause I think those are really, um, you know, the, the both, both of your, um, points range from, I think specifics to the, the very broad. So that's really helpful. Um, you know, I think that the the problem, the, the kind of mindset we have to break is that worker participation and worker voice will cost the company something, or in many cases that unionization or increased compensation will cost the company something. And I think it's the opposite. We've seen uh, all kinds of examples, really rigorous research that when employees have more participation, when they have uh, more financial stake in a company, they are, you know, a bet they are better set up to be part of the innovation process that that company is undertaking. They will, uh, you know, we will see less turnover, which is one of the biggest costs that businesses face. We will see less strife, and I think in, you know, in our time, we will see less uh, consumer backlash. So I like to think about the example of Starbucks, where if you know Starbucks, this a uh, coffee chain that, you know, put itself out there in many ways culturally as, uh, you know, sort of a hip millennial place, come get your frappuccino, right? When workers started organizing, Starbucks management had choices to make. They could have really taken a very different direction along the lines of what Larry was saying. Uh, how do we actually be the high road employer that we say we are, right? But instead, they took a totally opposite uh, tack. And they're uh, negative attacks on workers' freedom of association was noticed by consumers and was noticed by shareholders. And that had really negative implications for the company. So I think that really making sure that we break this mindset that these things are costs and actually see them as benefits for companies uh, will really help us to, to strengthen the case. And I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great example of a company, you know, that was also famous for having a, a an empty chair at its board, you know, in its board meetings to kind of represent the importance of the worker's voice. But to your point, Larry, I think um, when you say that you're listening, and then when workers voice something that they need and you don't act, um, that actually breaks trust. Um, as opposed to builds trust. And so I think, you know, there is a, a theme to pull out here. And one of the reasons that we talk about these mechanisms as opposed to um, purely kind of listening mechanisms is that um, there, there has to be a combination and in, in our understanding, a, a combination of, you know, real systems for listening and systems of accountability um, that reinforce kind of what the company or, or uh, workplace does with that information. And that's where these kinds of structures of shared ownership or shared governance um, or worker representation kind of um, go beyond the like benevolent CEO, benevolent kind of dictator model of management. Because a lot of these factors that you're talking about boil down to kind of you know, really good tried and true management practices, right? Um, and as some of our members will say, you know, is it possible 
to do everything that we do for our employees without union representation? Sure, we could absolutely choose to do them. Would we? You know, that's a that's a tougher question. And maybe sometimes we would and maybe sometimes we wouldn't. And these are the systems that kind of keep the, the lines of communication and accountability open um, so that ultimately you you um, uh, reap the, the benefits in the long term, um, the shared benefits. Um, and I think you also all ultimately address the one of the questions that I was going to ask, which is sort of the um, democracy is famously like not the uh, not designed to make decisions super quickly um, or efficiently, certainly in the in the political realm. And so in the workplace, this is kind of the opposite of the, you know, the early Facebook motto of move, move fast and break things, which of course the company did jettison a decade ago, but still sort of emblematic of a certain type of uh, workplace philosophy. But I think you all address kind of the, the fallacies of, of those um, kind of traditional ideas about how worker participation um, is a cost or slows things down and where if you do it well um, with all of these kind of supporting management mechanisms, um, it's really something that that unlocks unlocks innovation. Um, we did have an audience question um, for you, Larry, in particular about like if you have can share some more examples um, of companies or experiences you've had where consistent communication between union leaders and mid-level managers, um, you know, where, where that works um, or a little bit more about how, how that works well. Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, I would say that probably the greatest success that we had at that um, experience I had at Sierra Club, um, and I really should try to get a talk going between the previous management there and, and the union leadership from the era, because I think it was really special. Um, we had a wage scale, like most organizations do, that was pretty broad. It went pretty low from like $36,000 up to like 100 and maybe 50 or 60. And the 36,000 was like, you know, brand new folks out of college. And, you know, the reality is that a lot of organizations are pulled by the inertia of the industry within which they operate. So if all the other nonprofits are paying $36,000, you just kind of do the same. You think it's fine. And then the, the workers kind of are getting this argument about, well, we don't make enough. And then it's just it's this like circular argument where who's right, who's wrong, who's wrong. But the, the solution we found, I think, was really elegant. We use the MIT Family Sustaining Wage Calculator, and we humbly brought it to them and said, listen, we think that folks are getting paid too low, but let's not try to make the standard, your standard, our standard. Let's agree on this normative standard. And let's say that, you know, based on, you know, what the, if you're not familiar with the MIT Family Sustaining Wage Calculator, it determines how much would you need to live in any given city around the world uh, based on, you know, having one family member, two family members. Uh, two adults and one child, and so on and so on. I believe there's 12 permutations. And we tried to pick what we thought was a generous uh, example. So an adult with like three children saying, hey, everybody should, should be able to have at least one child, but if you have three, you should be able to take care of it. Well, Sierra Club went even further than that and said, listen, we're going to average to get together the 12 permutations because no matter what type of family you have, you should be able to care for your kids and, and yourselves. And we're going to apply that across our national staff, which is, if you know Sierra Club, it's a massive organization with lots of uh, local chapters, has two headquarters, one in California, one in DC. So that meant that our wage scale went from $36,000 floor to like $55,000. All these people instantly got raises. Uh, and then a lot of people um, who were not in the union at the chapter, this took a lot of negotiation, but they ended up getting unionization for the first time. Um, and that meant them having benefits and things that they never had before. So very complicated organization and it's sort of a sort of a niche example. But I think that applies to any organization that listens to their workers. And one more really quick example. Um, we always talk about, hey, you know, can workers do this without a union? Think about all the changes that have happened in the United States in the last, I'd say, 10 years since the labor movement has really made a resurgence. $15 an hour is now the minimum wage in many states. That didn't just start by chance. That was because SCIU started a campaign called Fight for 15, and now this is the standard. So my challenge to these employers is, if you can do it without a union, please absolutely do it. But if you can't, then you should consider just supporting your workers when they want to unionize and then working with them. 
Well, and fun fact, Fight for 15 actually started, the campaign started as Fight for 15 and a union. <laughs> and <laughs> the union piece was sort of dropped, um, but but it, that is the spirit, right? And as well as the, the organizing muscle behind it. Um, um, so- Can I give a, one other example yeah, of that? please. Real quick, because I think so much of our economy, um, a lot of our mental models of our economy are based on the 20th century, right? Manufacturing, industrial economy. But we live in an economy that's, you know, mostly services and healthcare is really one of our biggest and most central economic generators and employers. And when I was um, uh, organizing, one of the best uh, outcomes of successful union formation in private sector healthcare organizations were improved quality of care mm -hmm. for people who were in this case um, who had different um, long-term healthcare challenges and we're receiving um, care in, in what are called adult uh, daycare, day centers. Um, and there was all kinds of issues that mid-level management simply ignored, right? Most of the time because they, uh, you know, didn't want, didn't have really the right structures to hear from their workers. They would write it off as complaining or they were just trying to keep um, the bottom line uh, you know, keep making, you know, keep squeezing things as much as possible in many cases, even though this was state money, this was public money supporting these private healthcare companies. Um, and the union structure really enabled workers to come together and say, you know, we have a clear answer to how to solve some of the problems that are affecting both us as workers, but also affecting the quality of care for the people who we are taking care of for, you know, eight, 12 hours a day. And I think that that's a really important example as we, as our economy continues to grow in healthcare and in education and other service sectors of the economy, we need to keep in mind that often these are human services where the, you know, the output, as economists would put it, is also a human being. And so that um, union relationship can, with middle management, a lot of the time can actually uh, benefit everyone. And I'll just say another theme in terms of kind of enablers um, that I'm hearing and that I've heard before is this engagement with middle management because, you know, not to demonize them, but actually to to say like they they can often get squeezed um, in between, you know, the the kind of, especially in an environment where maybe there is a union that they are not allowed to be part of um, and um, they, uh, I think, engaging them and helping empower them in their role in this relationship is so important and that's where training comes in and that's where communication comes in and committees um, because they may feel like their measures of success coming from above are really different from you know what what the workforce is asking for and so they play a really important role in harmonizing and they need to be supported um, in, in a, a number of ways in order to realize these benefits that we're talking about. Um, so uh, I, a couple of, of sort of closing-ish questions before we get to really open it up to, um, to the audience. Um, it, it has been said that the workplace is one of the few remaining spaces where Americans interact and build relationships across difference. Um, as Americans have become more polarized politically and fractured culturally, how can these participatory processes help workplaces navigate complexity and conflict? And I'll just, I may like combine this with this larger question of um, how democratic mechanisms in the workplace, um, you know, may have a bearing on our broader kind of social fabric and at this time of low social trust. Um, and I, I think those two are really related. Um, so it's a bit of a leading question, but um, but I'd love to hear what in your experience, kind of how these dynamics um, interplay. Yeah, so this question is it's coming up a lot lately. No, no surprise, right? But um, <laughs> I think you know when we look at worker co-ops, so we we published um, about a year ago the first study on um, individual workers within worker cooperatives to understand their individual experiences um, in comparison to their experience at a, uh, a non-worker owned company. Um, and one of the things that we saw was that um, workers within uh, worker cooperatives often 
they will they tend to vote at much higher rates, particularly during the midterm elections, like you know more than twenty percent the the rate of the the general population. Um, and what it tells us is that workers who are building the muscles of democracy every single day, they really begin to understand the value of their voice. And democracy is no longer something that just pops up every four years and is focused on this quote unquote like right or wrong outcome. Right? I think typically. Um, you know, most of us, when we think about democracy, we do think about that that four year election. Um, we do think about it in terms of like what's our outcome going to be. But I think you said this in, in your intro, Lee, but that democracy is really a process. It's about being able to uh, develop, to trust, and to practice in these um, structures of engagement that allow us to um, listen to other people and to understand what's important to them, to have our voice heard, to collectively make a decision together and understand that the outcome is determined collectively and it's for the greater good. Um, so one of the biggest things that I that I'm beginning to think about is you know how do we really emphasize democracy being a process again as opposed to this you know um, a, a game that just has a win or lose at the end of it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll add on to that. It, that's very much along the lines of what I was thinking and no surprise, two weeks out from a presidential election where we're thinking about this. Um, but I think, you know, because we have in the United States two dominant parties, we forget that actually there can be, you know, pluralistic outcomes. Democracy is messy. And I think the more that you practice that um, in your daily life and where do we spend most of our time in our lives? At our workplace, right? So the more that we're having these experiences of, you know, the messy process of democracy, I think the more we will participate in um, political democracy from the federal, you know, level all the way down. And there's a lot of, you know, rigorous scholarly evidence that has shown that people who are uh, members of unions vote more frequently, as Julian said, in midterms, but across all kinds of different metrics. I think there's a lot of evidence from around the world that, you know, uh, institutions, right, it, participatory institutions, when people belong to them, whether it be a more participatory political party or a union or other social organizations, the more that they, you know, feel a sense of trust that the society, even if it's, you know, broken in many ways or not working for them perfectly, um, that, you know, that people are going towards the same goals. And I think, you know, we have um, such a dramatic situation right now in the United States of fracturing, of polarization. Um, I think that these types of practices, uh, you know, in many ways, because trust in government is so low, it's actually time, it's even more important for businesses to lead and for leaders of businesses to say, you know, I'm not going to follow the old playbook of hiring the union busting consultant or of ignoring, you know, what workers are saying about conditions, you know, in the workplace. I'm actually going to take a different approach because we actually need to kind of reset our social norms around discussion, around participation, around democratic deliberation. Um, so I'm, you know, though there's a lot of challenges, I think all of the examples that we're talking about today do give us kind of a roadmap of how to start to, you know, rebuild some of that trust. Really good answer. Um, I, I think I see it both from the employer perspective and the union perspective or the worker perspective. Um, I think from an employer perspective, I like to know exactly how much I'm spending on labor year over year. And if you have a unionized work, workforce, that's pretty clear. I know that I'm not going to have a lot of turnover, right? Because folks are pretty much uh, better taken care of um, because they have input. Um, and I know that there's conflicts that are sort of member to member, worker to worker, then the union is likely going to have a hand in being a conflict resolution uh, system, or I will have a system between myself and the union to solve problems. Whereas if there isn't, it's sort of a free for all and it's all on the employer to solve it. I think from the union side, I mean, this is really the reason why I fell in love with the labor movement, you know, 15 years ago was the first time I ever saw people coming together over something that wasn't, you know, surface level, you know, we're the same gender, we're the same age or whatever, was working at a union and being in a union. There's a interview I did, it's on my channel actually on YouTube, um, where they went before the election and they were asking everyone who they were voting for. And let me tell you, it was a very, very diverse local union. You had people from all ages and races in that room. 
And they were voting for different people. But guess what? They were sitting in the same room together. And since COVID, that's the one thing you never see is everybody coming together and just being a family. So that's that's how I see it. Thank you. Um, I, a little bit along these lines, but um, maybe less rosy. Um, and I'll start direct this to you, Lenora, and then and then anyone else is is welcome to chime in. So much of your work, um, including your forthcoming book, which you should mention, is focused on public policy um, and how policy can shape corporate governance to make companies more accountable to and their decision making more inclusive of workers and other stakeholders. So there are some questions in the audience and, and something I think we just have to address, which is like, we are unlikely to see federal policy move in this direction in the next four years. Um, although, you know, there there is bipartisan support for employee ownership, so maybe you can speak to that a bit. Um, but Americans did vote for um, worker-friendly policies at the state and local levels at the same time in, in this election. And um, so I'm curious what you see as sort of bright spots for advancing workplace democracy through public policy um, and what policy models are out there that could be adopted at the state and local level to help you know, bring these mechanisms to, to scale? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think that the answer really is state and local in this period of time. And just to step back, you know, it's important to, to remember that one of the uh, ways in which the U.S. is different than a lot of other countries is we have, you know, this very decentralized government in which lots and lots of power is centered in states and you know even municipalities, and so uh, that includes our corporate governance structure. People might not be aware of this, but we don't have federal corporate law, right? We have state corporate law. Most corporations, most large corporations in the United States, are incorporated in the state of Delaware that has less, I think, less than a million uh, residents, because that's a state that, over time, for historical reasons, has become the most business friendly state to incorporate. So I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, um, I so I have a book called Good Company Economic Policy After Shareholder Primacy that looks at the history of shareholder primacy, but then mainly focuses on what kinds of um, policy measures supporting worker participation on board, supporting employee ownership, changing board fiduciary duty to be um, towards the entire uh, company rather than just to shareholders, you know, many of those policies would necessarily in, in some cases need to be federal. And, uh, you know, I think the truth is that a lot of these policies are longer term in any case. We weren't going to see them, uh, you know, be signed by a president in the next administration uh, in any case, because we have a very divided Congress, no matter who's in the White House. Um, but we do have measures like the Accountable Capitalism Act that Senator Elizabeth Warren put out a number of years ago. We've had other measures like the Reward Work Act put out by Senator Tammy Baldwin and others that was about um, worker participation on boards. But I think we really need to, in this moment, um, lift up these measures at the state and local level. So I, my colleagues can you know, talk even more about this, but there's a, been a lot of efforts around um, the country at different states to support employee ownership. So we have government employee ownership centers that have, um, you know, come to be in the last uh, five, six, seven years in, in a number of different states. We have efforts around sectoral bargaining that are, for example, in California around fast food workers. Um, I think these kinds of efforts are going to become more and more important around public policy in the next couple of years. And then I'll just, you know, return to a, a point that I said a little bit ago, which is that there's also just an opportunity for you know the private sector to lead without policy, uh, you know mandating what they do. So again, I think sort of the theme of uh, this conversation is there are lots of opportunities right now that actually don't take policy change that can engage more directly workers in you know in participatory structures inside their companies, whether they're small or you know the very largest. And experimenting with those as much as possible, I think, is actually what will tell us what are the you know best policies that we should that we should continue to push for whenever we um, have the political will to do so. Thanks, Lenore. Julian, do you want to add a little bit about 
the policy landscape on worker ownership? Sure. Um, and Lenore, I mean, just an excellent response. I think there's so much that you shared that that I was thinking about. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Liba, employee ownership does benefit from bipartisan support. Um, the Mainstream Employee Ownership Act was passed in 2018, and that was signed into law by, by President Trump. Um, so, I mean, a big picture is, I think, that for employee ownership, there's, I think there's still opportunity to sort of move work ahead, particularly um, as folks focus on uh, how do we support uh, workers in rural communities to really um, own their own businesses and have a say in, in their workplace? Um, the silver tsunami, I think, um, provides a really strong backdrop for that. You know, and we're in the midst of seeing businesses evaporate from our communities, particularly at the rural level. Um, and so I, I expect that to still be a focus or at least a, an area where we can move things forward um, in, in a good way over the next four years. Uh, aside from that, you know, there has been a lot of momentum that has been built at the federal level. The Worker Ownership Readiness and Knowledge Act was passed, had not been appropriated. And uh, although, so we're, we're pushing for that, not sure it's going to happen in the next month and a week or so, but, <laughs> but hopes are high. Um, you know, but much of our attention is, as Lenora said, I think, turning towards the state and municipal level. And there's just tremendous opportunity there to build support um, for employee ownership. There is uh, there are opportunities, I think, to leverage workforce development um, dollars and resources to um, to train workers and thinking as owners and to build their voice and to build relationships with, with unions. There's also a, uh, a growing relationship between worker cooperatives and unions that I think is really important here from a policy perspective as we're able to identify um, what are some of the improvements that can be made, you know, at the sectoral level, um, and we can combine, um, you know, combine our voices and, and create a united front to get the policy that, that can be supportive of workers on a greater level. Thank you so much. Um, Larry, do you, do you want to speak a little bit to some of those recent policies, the bill that just passed in Massachusetts, um, affording collective bargaining rights to rideshare drivers or California fast food, kind of local examples of um, innovation in, in labor uh, and, and union law. Yeah, I think that's really, really massive, um, especially the bill for the Massachusetts workers. Um, I think when you think about rideshare drivers, but in particular, there is no way for them to express their voice. They rarely even see each other on the road. So, you know, you're really alone, right? Um, I think many of the folks who are doing these jobs, um, they sort of operate in a silo. They think of it as a part-time opportunity. So they really have low expectations about what they deserve in that situation. Um, but from the organizing that I've been a part of, I think that these drivers, a lot of them, if they could do it full-time, they would. And if they could get benefits, they would. What we've seen is a play, uh, a shift in places like California, where you saw Lyft and Uber drivers organizing and unions like the machinists and the Teamsters really investing their time and resources in these campaigns is the regulatory environment is not friendly. And, you know, typically these folks are thought of as independent contractors. And what you have is people who are working uh, five or five or six different jobs per month. They're doing uh, uh, Lyft, um, Grubhub. Uh, DoorDash, you know, as Instacart, as many of these things, they can cobble together to try and make a living and they're still not making it. So I think what I like about these bills is there's an opportunity to build some collective power for these workers. Um, and then in terms of the companies that are operating these platforms, I obviously want them to survive and thrive because they've been so useful for us, especially during the pandemic. But if they're going to survive over the long term, we can't just have Americans working six or seven jobs at one time and call that a living. To me, that's not really employment. And I think recognizing the changing nature of work is the best thing that comes out of this, because if we still use this employment standard from 1925 or 19, 1915, that didn't really uh, address people having multiple opportunities. And then now they're not putting in applications and therefore they sort of fall through the cracks. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's to me, it's sort of a future of work conversation. And I, I'm glad that we're trying to address it um, state by state. And hopefully I think we can do it nationally at some point. Thanks, Larry. We have a, a lot of questions that are asking for advice about um, how these mechanisms play out in particular types of workplaces, whether it has to do with um, kind of generational divides in the workplace or the differences between workplaces where folks tend to have very long tenures versus workplaces where there's a lot of turnover, um, you know, nonprofits versus public sector versus publicly traded companies versus like startups. And I, I think um, 
I mean, I'm certainly curious um, if you if you want to speak to any of those in particular, but rather than trying to use the few minutes we have left to go through um, each case, I'm curious if you have um, some takeaways for folks about, because we're in this sort of like voluntary, in most cases in this kind of voluntary implementation zone, to your point, uh, Lenore, about kind of the opportunity for work places to lead um, and be ahead of policy, what are the what are the considerations um, that that um, individual like that employers should keep in mind about which forms um, might be right for them and um, and maybe what resources are out there to help them navigate um, that decision tree uh, when it comes to like wanting to support this principle of workplace democracy and trying to understand um, which forms might be right. Um, right and wrong for their own workplaces. Um, Julian, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that is becoming increasingly apparent to us, um, as you know, as you said, Libra, we work with uh, a variety of firms from worker co-ops to ESOPs with, uh, with democratic workplace practices. You know, one of, I think, the, the core learnings that we have is before you can even go to be thinking about, you know, what structures and decisions are really a fit for our business, you've really got to make sure that your workers' basic needs are met. Like, do they have the wages that they that they deserve and are contributing in terms in terms of um, creating contributing to uh, company value? Do they have access to the benefits that they really need to support their families? Um, without that, workers are not interested in whether or not I can have a seat on the board. Um, so that I think is step number one. Um, beyond that, I think there are a number of resources out there that can help a business think about, and when I say business, I'm thinking about for-profit and non-profit, because DAWI, we have membership as a non-profit, and so our workers, um, they can become a member, they sit on they sit on committees and create policy, um, and so before, or in terms of resources that are available to get someone started, once you have those basic needs met, um, our we actually have put out a guide for democratic management. It's sort of like it's a, it's when I say guide, I, I use that word loosely. It's a book. It's like 120 pages um, that gives you a little bit of uh, uh, concrete steps to take to begin to share information, to begin to figure out what are the types of decisions that we can um, we can have either our workers co to contribute to, our management level contribute to. Um, what, how do we support our workers to develop the skills to contribute to decision making? Um, so that that's a, I think a good resource for a number of businesses to take a look at. Uh, our website is institute.coop. So if folks want to go and visit and check that out. Thank you so much. And does that include anything about open book management, which you mentioned earlier, because there was a question, an audience question about it. Does management. yes, it includes a little bit of open book management. If you're looking at that for that specifically, I'd recommend the Great Game of Business, which is just an excellent resource um, for for profit firms. Any other thoughts about kind of yeah. navigating? Yeah, I would add. I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of resources out there, and so rather, I definitely can't you know name them all, but I think that. Um, no one should feel like they're charting this course themselves. So, you know, DAWI is an incredible organization, um, the National Center for Employee Ownership. There's a lot of, um, you know, different entities in certainly supporting the labor, you know, certain supporting worker organizing in the labor movement, starting with the AFL-CIO has a whole section on uh, how to organize your workplace, the um, Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee. Um, so, you know, mostly I think it might take a little bit of research and time uh, looking around, but I think, you know, I'll maybe speak for my um, co-panelists. I think all of us are, uh, can be resources for people, certainly, um, you know, the Aspen and, and EOP and the Roundtable are resources. So I think no one should feel like they're charting the course on this themselves. Thanks for the plug for all of us, um, <laughs> Lenore. And um, uh, and I just want to name also for the audience, like I, 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 I didn't say we were starting to go to audience Q and A, but certainly if you have another question, uh, we, I've been incorporating them. So if you have a a burning question that you haven't submitted yet, please now is the time um, be before we close. Um, and uh, and I just want to. There, there was another question about um, ways that workers um, who hold shares in public companies um, can uh, 
exert influence. And I and, and it brings me back to a point that I meant to make earlier, which is also that, you know, Lenore, you talk about boards, and I think it's it's worth just naming that when we have this idea that there's no room for democratic systems in the workplace, like boards are, <laughs> you know, a great like counterfactual to that. Like we actually do have ostensibly, you know, democratic systems that govern every workplace um, and and every organization or or most of them. Um, and so it's not that that those systems are unfamiliar and boards obviously have a very particular role, but they do operate democratically and ostensibly are supposed to kind of represent certain interests um, and, and help make decisions and create a, some accountability for between management and, and other interests. So it's not alien to even the way that most organizations operate. It's just a question of who's at the table, right? Um, so yeah, so this question of the role of, of shareholders and, and all, of, all of us and, and workers who, who have a stake yeah, I think, you know, connect with your pension fund, connect with the, um, you know, shareholder organization um, that, you know, might be connected to your employer or your um, faith-based institution or your, you know, uh, community. I think that we have at this moment um, a tremendous amount of really important shareholder activism going on to try to actually shift how corporations work as well. And I think that there's a lot of those organizations, you know, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, that uh, do actually require worker participation on some certain pension boards. And there's a lot of other organizations where if people are interested, they can get uh, increasingly, you know, they can get more involved for sure. Thank you so much. And I we, we're, we're at time. Um, oh no, I think we maybe we have one, one minute if anyone else wants to my clock is different from this clock if, if anyone else wanted to weigh in on that question before i close um thank you um so thank you so much to all of you lenore larry and julian for being here today um, and sharing your perspective and expertise and thank you to the audience for really excellent questions um, and and engagement um, the Economic Opportunities Program has a full slate of events like this that are planned for 2025. So if you're not already on the mailing list, please do sign up now to get information straight to your inbox um, and, and also stick around for a second to, to fill out that post-event survey. Um, no event would be complete without a shout out to my colleagues across the Economic Opportunities Program for helping pull together today's event. Um, they include Tony Mastria, Nora Heffernan, Francis Almodovar, Matt Helmer and Maureen Conway, our fearless leader who uh, was not able to join us today, but um, is you know very supportive of this line of conversation and to our partners at Architects for making sure everything uh, runs smoothly and, and addressing some of the sound issues early on. Um, so thank you all and um, have a great day. <laughs>